everybody. Welcome to another video by Liminal Spaces. So today we're talking about another story out of Philip K. Dick's paycheck. Collection of short stories, of course. This one is called The Infatigable Frog. Now, infatigable means unable to fatigue or never gets tired. So a frog that could hop forever, basically. And the story opens with the line, Zeno was the first great scientist. And that is spoken by a professor. Professor Hardy, I believe, is the name. So, <laughs> Zeno is a real person. Zeno lived in Greece between 490 BC and 430 BC. He's before Socrates. So, I think there's a bit of a debate as to whether he's a scientist or a philosopher, or maybe I should say a mathematician or a philosopher. That's kind of what this story is about. There's a mathematician professor and a philosopher professor. Uh, neither of these were my field of study. I do love math, but philosophy I don't know much about at all. So in reading about Zeno, he did not believe in plurality. He did not believe in movement, not like just our normal movement, but like space-time and motion. So he was creating all of these paradoxes to try to disprove that there were many objects instead of just one huge object and to disprove the idea of motion, I guess. One of them that he created is called the dichotomy paradox. So the dichotomy paradox states that anytime you travel, you can always travel half the distance before you travel the whole distance. And because you reach half the distance before you reach the whole distance, you will never reach the end of your destination. So I, of course, I love the mathematical idea. We, we probably learned it in grade school that any you can always cut a number in half, and if you do, you will never get to zero. You can always make a smaller number. And that's, that's fascinating. That's fun, right? But to try to tie it into, and this is just philosophy, which I have not studied, so I'm sure there's people that are like, well, you're missing the main point, right? <laughs> to suggest that because you reach the halfway point before you reach the finish means you never go further than the halfway point? I don't know. The whole thing sounds a little bit strange to me. In my research, I, I did find that a lot of more recent mathematical discoveries and philosophies have kind of disproven this stuff, but people still argue about it, apparently. So that's what this story is about. There's two professors that are arguing about this dichotomy paradox. So they phrase it as, if you had a frog in a well, the frog could never ever make it out. Now, completely take out the fact that the frog can't jump high enough to jump out of the well. Apparently there's like steps on the wall or who knows what, right? The frog can jump toward the edge of the well, but because of the dichotomy paradox, apparently the frog will only jump halfway toward the edge of the well, and therefore the frog will jump less and less and less and less. And we know it's not because the frog's getting tired, because, of course, of the name of the story. The frog does not get tired, but the frog only jumps half the distance, so it's never going to make it. So they fight about this. They literally get into an argument in the hallway, and the dean catches them. And the dean's like, I cannot have you guys fighting in the hallway. It's ridiculous. You need to prove this one way or the other. I want you to build a well. I want you to get a frog. I want you to do the experiment and prove that it either can make it out or it can't make it out. So they're like, okay, let's do this thing. They create this really long tube and they've got a heater under it so that they can slowly heat up the tube from the end with the entrance all the way up to the end with the exit so that they can put a frog in, heat it up, the frog will start to jump, and then they'll see if it pops out the other end. Now, the one professor who believes it will never leave the tube comes up with this really brilliant thing, which is probably why this is sci-fi. He makes it so that every jump the frog takes the frog loses half of its mass. And that was part of Zeno's 
philosophy, the idea that everything must have infinite mass and I guess no mass at the same time. And that's why you can never make it to the end. So that's a piece of this, right? The, the frog loses half of its mass every time it jumps. Therefore, it can only jump half as far because it's a smaller frog. So they're like, okay, let's do this. They put the frog in, they start heating up the pipe. The frog jumps, it gets smaller, it jumps, it gets smaller, and it jumps to the point that they can't see it anymore. And so Professor Hardy declares, because they can't see the frog anymore, that he basically won, that Zeno was right, the frog could never make it out the end of the tube. And what they've got at the end is a photon barrier or something like that, so that if anything passes through that, First off, they'll gain all their mass back. They'll go back to normal size. And secondly, it will tell them that something passed through, that the frog made it out. It has a little alarm set to it or whatever. And the other professor's like, no, no, no. There's no way you could have won. The frog's just too small to see. I'm going to get in there and check it out. So the other professor crawls in the tube. And when he crawls in, Professor Hardy slams the door on him and starts the heat. And he says, well, let's see if you can make it out. So this guy is now trapped in here. The floor starts heating up and he starts crawling toward the exit, of course. But as he goes, suddenly there's this big jolt as he loses half of his mass. And of course, he starts to freak out. But he tells himself to relax. He pulls out a piece of paper and a pencil that he has in his pocket. He does a bunch of calculations and he determines that after nine days, even if he's losing half of his mass every once in a while, after nine days, he should be able to make it out the end of the tube, which sounds insane because I assume he'll be long dead by then, but that's enough to drive him on. So he just gets hauling towards the end of the tube and he keeps getting smaller and smaller. There's a moment in the story where he gets lost. He can't tell what, what direction he's going, but then suddenly he gets smaller again. So he realizes he's going the right direction. So he keeps going and going and the floor keeps getting rougher and rougher. And he talks about how they made it super smooth with their steel wool and all that stuff. But of course, obviously, he's getting so small that smooth to us would not be smooth to him, right? And he keeps shrinking and it gets to the point where there's these huge boulders and he's literally trying to jump from one boulder to the next. And then he shrinks again, like mid jump and it's way too far. There's no way he could ever make it to the next boulder. So he just starts falling. Then we cut to the classroom and Professor Hardy is explaining that he won. The frog could not make it out the end of the tunnel. He was clearly right the entire time. And this really drove the other professor insane. And he's decided to take a long holiday. And he left for the woods. So I guess that's his alibi, <laughs> right? <laughs> that he murdered this guy. All the students are like, wow, that's very fascinating, very interesting. But then suddenly a frog jumps into the room, into the classroom. And one of the students is like, oh my gosh, that's the frog. The frog did make it out. You were wrong. And the professor's like, no, that can't be the same frog. And then the student says, actually, I have a theory. Maybe the frog didn't make it out the end. Maybe the frog got so small that it fell between the atoms of the tube. And when it fell through the bottom of the tube, it regained its normal mass and just landed on the floor below the tube. And the teacher's like, ah, and then the bell rings, everybody leaves, and then a student comes running back in and says, Professor, there's a man with a blanket wrapped around him outside who's insisting upon seeing you right now. And Professor Hardy's like, oh boy. So he gets up and he goes out, and sure enough, there's the professor, the other professor there, uh, naked, because as he was shrinking, his clothes didn't shrink. Only he shrank. Interesting. So yeah, he, he's naked. He's got a towel, a blanket wrapped around him. And he says, this doesn't prove anything. I got too small and I fell between the atoms. We are going to go back down there. We are going to fix this problem. And we're going to find out the truth about this paradox. And the other professor is like, uh, listen, can I? And he keeps getting interrupted. He's like, yeah, but can I? I assume he wants to apologize, I guess. But 
they end up just going down together to continue to try to prove this paradox. And that's the end. It's a very strange, very interesting story. I did enjoy it. It was fun. Obviously, of course, character development isn't really there. Doesn't matter. That's a Philip K. Dick thing. It's more about the story than it is about the characters. Very good story. Interesting idea. I am not sure whether he is just pointing out how ridiculous professors can be and how constantly bickering about philosophy versus math if it's that literal, or if he's just saying that bickering in general is ridiculous. I kind of, I kind of err on that side. You know, I know that Philip K. Dick is a religious person. I'm going to, I'm going to use the term religious, maybe spiritual is a better term. I'm not sure, but he definitely is taken by the idea of some kind of higher power, right? It comes up in a lot of his books. So I, I wonder if, if he was sort of critiquing the idea of debating religion versus science or philosophy versus science. I feel like that's probably the main theme of the thing, because these two professors seem a little bit idiotic. I mean, the way they're arguing in the hallway, because they both insist that they're right, you know, they don't understand, I guess, the idea that people have opinions. You know what I mean? Uh, that's that's just the way life works. And generally, people don't agree with each other. And that's OK. That's just part of life. So I, I, I think that that makes them kind of staunch and unyielding, which is not not a great thing it's not a great way to learn and grow and and to teach others and things like that you know what i mean especially for professors all right so that is the short story now i also finally read the i also finally read the introduction by roger zelazny and it's it's very straightforward he he, he talks about the fact that he knew philip k dick he liked him as a person. A couple things did stick out for me. Number one, he talks about how he was kind of sad that for most of Philip K. Dick's life, he was very, very poor. He felt like, and, and he didn't hang out with him all the time. He received mostly letters from him. But he felt like Philip K. Dick was only really successful and really actually happy once Blade Runner started filming. That at that point in his life, he had finally gained enough money and enough respect that he could feel good about be, himself being a writer. And that struck me. That That's very interesting because, of course, he passed away before Blade Runner was done filming. So it must have only been like a year or so right at the end of his life. But at least he got to experience a little bit of it, I guess. But that really struck me in the introduction. Also, he talked about how they would often talk about theology, about religion and that kind of stuff. And most of the time... Roger Zelazny couldn't tell if Philip K. Dick was joking or not, which is a very weird kind of cool statement uh, because, of course, it comes up in his books all the time. Chris talks about the humor of Philip K. Dick, and he might be telling stories a lot more often than we think he is. You know what I mean? He might be joking a lot, which is... A very interesting insight into Philip K. Dick, I believe. So it, it's a good introduction. I would recommend reading it. There's more to it than just that. Those are just the things that really stuck out to me in it. All right, so that's our video for today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit the like button. If you want to see more like this, make sure to subscribe and have a great day.